Well, hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe, a podcast and video. This is David Bonson. I am the Chief Investment Officer here at the Bonson Group and recording here for the last time in our current New York City office. We're getting ready to move into our big new offices with multiple people and so forth here. The move starts over the weekend and uh, we'll have like real studio there as I do out in California. It'll be uh, much better when I'm recording the podcast here in New York, but... In the meantime, there are things to share, and I think this will get us by just fine. Uh, I'm recording the middle of the market day on Thursday, and the market had been down about 200 points. It's now down less than 100, so it's come back a bit. But coming into today on Thursday, the market had been up about 400 points or so on the week. So where we stand now, we're up a good 300 points net-net on the week, probably a little more. And that could go lower from here, go higher from here. But the point is that the movement higher in markets has continued. Uh, That has not happened as a result of a huge alleviation of fears around coronavirus. It's largely happened around a shrugging off of fears around coronavirus. In fact, a lot of the kind of uncertainty and conditions, news reports wise, um, have worsened, not not gotten better. So that that whole situation continues to be obviously very distressing from a health epidemic standpoint. But markets have uh, chosen to to not allow, let that hold them down. The the theory I would postulate this week at Dividend Cafe is a lot of it is the earnings side, which has been kind of neutral, uh, not bad at all so far this quarter, but not necessarily allowing for kind of a breakout. But then um, really, as you've gotten a little deeper into it at this point, near the very end of the earnings season from fourth quarter, it's quite obvious that we're going to outperform earnings expectations from a consensus um, expectation standpoint by well over 2%. There was a, a average projection of about 0.3% negative earnings growth that analysts were expecting. And it looks like we're going to end up between 2 and 2.5% two and positive earnings growth. So again, a, about a 2.5% reversal from what had been expected, and that's become more evident and solidified in the last couple of weeks, and that's given a little bit more optimism and confidence to markets. Additionally, the forward guidance from companies for their 2020 full-year projections have gotten better, firmed up a bit, and that's um, even with some of the kind of hesitancy that exists right now around various things from coronavirus to um, the Democratic primary and so forth. So, If I were to dedicate my time this week to just talking about what's going on in the markets this week, it would be mostly how the markets just clearly want to continue going higher. That's generally what you expect when you're getting positive earnings revisions, when you're in a low inflation environment, and when you have low interest rates um, making other asset classes less attractive. Are things going to get too frothy? You know, I mean, I would expect that they will at some point, but in the meantime, I'm not sitting around shocked that risk assets are continuing to go higher. Um, Resilience, as I've written about in in more recent weeks, is a defining hallmark of a bull market. Markets do shrug off bad news or uncertain news um, out of a spirit of resilience that defines bull markets when you're really in one. And we've, we've been in a bull market for a long time, no matter how many people have voluntarily chosen to miss out on it. Um, now, does that suggest then that all the things that have been working are what will continue to work? You know, no. And one thing I kind of did this week in Divin Cafe that I'm really proud of is work through this idea about declining interest rates and make a comparison to the bond market and high growth stocks. Because there's really nothing that re-rates and revalues, reprices high growth stocks more than declining interest rate. You have this high multiple, but that high multiple becomes even more valuable for fast growing companies when the the interest rate, the risk free rate, what we would call uh, the discount rate in finance is declining, okay? Well, we know with bonds that they go higher in value and interest rates drop. And I've made the point over and over again that that happened rather suddenly and significantly last year and made for quite a, a above average return in, in bonds, but that it would be difficult to replicate just because of math. Now, of course, Rates can go even lower in bonds, and that would push you know returns up higher, except for at this point that really can't happen without it being in response to other bad things. Um, so why do we own bonds at all? It's because of the risk of bad things happening. It's a defensive asset class. We're not sitting here owning it saying, hey, I have a projection 
on a 1.6% 10-year bond rate going to 1%. And so therefore, we're putting a high offensive opportunistic uh, investment allocation into fixed income. Rather, it's the fear of other things happening um, that, that bonds become a sort of buffer against. Okay, well, so bonds benefit from dropping yields and high growth stocks do, but then now if you believe that the risk reward likelihoods are skewed against even further lower rates from here, which is different than rates staying low, I certainly am very much in the camp that rates are likely to stay in a low range for a long, long time. However, um, the idea of the trajectory continuing to go lower and lower, which it would be pushing higher and higher ratings and valuations around high growth stocks, strikes me as a very odd assumption. And then if you own it like we do bonds for defensive hedging type purposes, well, I, that would strike me as even much weirder that <laughs> someone would be owning the riskiest and frothiest of growth stocks for defensive purposes. Obviously, that would not be the case. So it does effectively argue for the notion of, of these high growth, high valuation stocks coming up upon the end of their day, unless you do get just this continual collapse of yields, which to me is only likely to happen if you have other macroeconomic events that are very negative, which would then offset that benefit with high growth stocks. So it suggests that one who's in the equity markets ought to be very focused on value. And by value, I mean things trading at an attractive level relative to the kind of discounting of their future cash flows. And we measure that through dividend growth. Um, other value investors measure it through a kind of measurement of future earnings and, and so forth and comparing it to present stock price. Uh, but my point being, there's a little bit higher quality regime that has been out of favor relative to big growth, big, uh, you know, especially in the tech sector for quite a while. And we think that would make a lot more sense here, regardless of whether that um, switch gets turned in a week or in you know six months. Uh, we're not making a timing comment at all. Uh, I believe that DividendCafe.com this week is more economic and more long-term economic than I've been in Dividend Cafe in a long time. I always try to nibble a bit uh, for readers who are interested in such things. I know that if I gave into my own instincts, I would write a 30-page Dividend Cafe every week that was entirely macroeconomic. It's much more interesting to me and I think more important to our clients as far as long-term investment objectives. But I also get that a lot of people want to be reading about more current events. And so, you know, to the extent that our view, we don't ever compromise sharing that short-term noise we don't think has barely anything at all to do with what long-term investor objectives and outcomes will end up being. Um, our job is not to avoid talking about the short-term noise. It's just to always be reminding you as to how little the short-term noise actually matters. But I think that um, behavioral response to short-term noise matters a lot, and it's why we obsess over it. But then I think long-term structural decision-making matters. And you look in the last 30 years at those who, who saw a, a secular decline in bond yields as being a big boost to real estate, being a big boost to bond prices, and being a big boost to equity markets, with the exception of the first decade of the 2000s, um, there was a structural theme that, that became very profitable for investors. When you look at those who um, looked at the emerging markets reality and the advent of, of greater globalization, particularly out of Brazil, Russia, India, and China in the first 10 years of the new millennium, that BRIC and the EM theme uh, was very profitable, particularly when um, uh, joined to a weakening U.S. dollar during the George W. Bush administrations. Um, so these are examples of things that actually were not cyclical and were, were not um, temporal. They were not by any means noise, uh, but were in fact very secular and structural themes that became quite investable and important. And we're living through uh, an issue right now um, that, that began at the point of the financial crisis as far as the uh, monetary policy interventions and their role 
in um, dealing with the debt crisis and their role previously in dealing with the systemic financial crisis. And what I think has effectively happened is that the central bank used tools as a policy response to the financial crisis. I believe them tooth and nail that their objectives were some sort of sensible response to the emergency of the moment. Uh, It doesn't mean I agree with what they did, but it does mean that I um, am sympathetic to what their motives were. And uh, yet I think that what happened is that they validated in the minds of some of the essential bankers certain tools that now with no sane person claiming we're still in a financial crisis and suffering through the same secular and systemic uh, undermining forces that we were over 10 years ago, um, yet a lot of these tools remain not just still at play, but being used heavier than ever. And so you sit here now almost 12 years after the financial crisis, and we are dealing with literally um, a zero interest rate policy and um, significant amounts of bond buying in a very high Federal Reserve balance sheet. And so I have to ask myself on behalf of my clients why we're doing this if indeed we're sitting in an environment where there is such a healthy um, economic backdrop and yet obviously uh, we are not experiencing the same um, you know, uh, crisis that we previously were. My own belief is that it's indisputable that it comes down to fiscal policy issues, meaning the vast amount of federal debt that has been put onto the balance sheet of the United States taxpayers um, has put us in the same position that other sovereign arenas have had to deal with, most notably Japan, the European Union, where there is excessive government indebtedness. And then it becomes um, the responsibility by default of a central bank to deal with it. Because fiscally speaking, they are not going to go cut spending and and cut entitlements and and do any of the things that may help alleviate the pressure on the balance sheet. And so I am very concerned over a 20, I mean, let's just call call it 10, 20, and 30-year period um, in terms of how macroeconomically these things will play out. And I uh, believe that bond yields are one of the most misunderstood things in all of finance because I hear people constantly talk about how mysterious it is that governments have spent so much money yet bond yields have come so much lower. And I don't believe it's mysterious. I believe that ultimately a long bond yield is itself um, a reflection of inflation expectations. And inflation expectations are largely determined by the velocity of money, by how much money supply is going higher. And then that money supply that is going higher is turning over in the economy. And that as Irving Fisher taught us, um, the whole price theory of money relies on velocity as the driver of inflation. Where there is no velocity, there is no inflation expectation, ergo lower bond yields. And right now, you have very low velocity, collapsing velocity of money, even with a very high excess reserves in our banking system, even with very high balance sheet of Federal Reserve, even with very low, low, low interest rates stimulating economic activity, we're not getting that velocity. And it is my belief that, and again, Irving Fisher would certainly agree with me here too, the great early 20th century economist, you're not getting that velocity because of excessive indebtedness that is itself a deterrent towards that economic activity. It's compressed growth, compressed productivity, and has resulted in very low velocity, which then means low inflation expectations, which then means low bond yields. So you can say, okay, if I rewind your podcast and listen again, I might be able to follow the chain of thought here. If you don't want to rewind the podcast, you can just read it in Dividend Cafe where I kind of map it out a little more visually It isn't very complicated, and I also don't think it's controversial. I'm very confident in the way that we are presenting this. However, the challenge becomes once you accept that bond yields have downward pressure, government indebtedness is the great economic issue of 
the next, uh, you know, 20 years, then you have to say, what are you going to do about it? And that's where I think the stage can be properly set to address um, investment allocation and where growth will come from, where value can be found, what um, low rates means to risk assets, and what it means to savers, to income investors in, in that kind of macro secular context. So read DividendCafe.com this week if you want some of it unpacked. There's some great charts as always. And I do hope that this podcast itself has given you a little of that Econ 101 that I want to be giving every single week. Reach out to us with any other questions. We'll see what the market holds next week. It'll be a short week again with another holiday on Monday um, uh, for President's Day. But uh, with that said, earnings season now more or less behind us and ready to move into the next chain of events. Obviously, a lot more conversation will continue to center on the Democratic primary. I unpack a lot of those things at DividendCafe.com. We know that there is not great clarity right now around where the primary is headed. Bernie Sanders still up near the top, but a lot of momentum behind three different not Bernie candidates. And it's totally unclear as to exactly how this thing is going to break one way or the other. Um, so m markets are not taking their P's and Q's from the primary, but uh, maybe some disagree with me on that. Okay, I will leave it there. Please reach out. Any questions, any comments, anytime. And please share Dividend Cafe podcast with your friends and family and colleagues and so forth. Uh, give us a nice review at iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you listen. And uh, thank you again. Um, reach out. Take care.